bad boy. So then we all can have a little little bit of a party here. Uh, so with a vulnerability scan, that actually is uh, finding uh, any. So this is a this is a, a passive scan, and it's finding known vulnerabilities on the network. Okay, so it finds those known vulnerabilities uh, by looking for things that it knows about. So if it has a signature, like for instance, maybe a CVE, a common vulnerability exposure, what it does is it looks for that signature of that vulnerability, and then it'll flag it and put it into the report. That's all it does, it just scans the network. So then, and this isn't just, just for you, this is, I think this is for everybody. Uh, so the, the vulnerability scan, there's a, a couple of tools out there and you can download, and I would recommend that you absolutely do, every one of you. Uh, I would download Nessus and play around with it. That's probably the best vulnerability scanner on the marketplace right now. And they'll give you, I think, a, a seven day trial on it. And it's pretty good, it's a pretty good one. We, we have a, a licensed copy that we use for that. And uh, it's a pretty good tool. Uh, so check it out. A penetration test is an active exploitation of known vulnerabilities. All right? So in order for me to actively exploit something i have to know the vulnerability so a pen test actually will include a vulnerability scan right so if i'm going through and somebody asked me to do a vulnerability scan on their network what i might do is i say yeah I'll give you a vulnerability scan. Um, you know, I'll run a couple tools. I won't just run Nessus. I'll run, you know, a couple other tools out here. We'll give them a quote, let's say for, you know, 11,000 bucks, we'll do a vulnerability scan for you. Uh, and, you know, all we're doing is we're scanning your network and just reporting back what we found. We're not doing anything else. It's the way that uh, I, I kind of think of it like this right here. If you think of, Jello, right? If you just think of the, you know, how Jello looks vulnerable when you when you look at it, when you when you shake it a little bit, it uh, you're just like, wow, that's pretty weak, and oh wow, it must taste pretty good. Uh, but in addition to that, if you were to you know just stick your finger in the Jello, there's a good chance that you can probably push your whole hand or your whole arm through that, that jello, right? But you don't have permission to do that. You don't have permission to do it. All that we have permission to do is maybe just to poke it, to see if it, if it responds in a certain way. And that's what the vulnerability is. The vulnerability scan is, is it's basically just touching the surface and kind of you know, poking it and getting out, poking it and getting out. Whereas the pen test, is we're first going to go in there and we're going to poke and we're going to get out poke and get out poke and get out and then after that now we're going to push our whole arm and then start to get all up in there and go all the way through with our entire body uh, because we know that those are vulnerabilities so with the pen test what we'll actually do is we'll do these things called proofs of concepts where if we know what a vulnerability is then we can go through and actively test that, actively exploit that based on whatever that vulnerability is. So that's the difference between the two. The answer to this one, active exploit is a pen test. Okay. 
I mean, it's up to you, Trent, whatever you want to do. Shane and Dave, you guys look like you're you're on the same mountaintop over there with those backgrounds, man. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Stop copying me. That's pretty cool. All right. Kelsey, make sense? Yes, sir. I, do, I was just second guessing myself. I do that a lot. Don't second. You're smart. Don't second guess yourself. <laughs> I think okay, she should go with uh, the third one. <laughs> let's go with Shane on this one. Shane, go ahead. Okay. Which is the following? Which of the following is the proper proper order for incident response? Uh, detection, containment, eradication, recovery, and preparation would be the bottom one. This is kind of obnoxious to read them all, but I'll do it. Preparation. No, you don't have to read them out loud. Just uh, <laughs> okay. you know, kind of because you know, if you're like me, if you read it out loud, you're gonna probably have to go through it again and then probably yeah. a third time. So don't you don't have to read it out loud, man. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always prepare is always the first thing, so I'll throw away A and D. Um and you can't recover until you've contained, so I would go with B. Okay, you're gonna go with Bravo. Uh, yes, sir. Well, you know, that was a pretty quick answer there. Uh, anybody agree or disagree with him here? Well, hopefully you agree because exactly what he said, right? You have to prepare first before you can do anything else. So you can't detect and certainly prepare wouldn't be at the end of it. So, you know, just like you said, get rid of that. Uh, prepare needs to be first. So we would get rid of that. And then here, um, you know, the recovery is gonna be last. So it's gotta be B. Excellent job there. Fantastic, fantastic. Trenton, that looks fantastic, buddy. All right, uh, Josh Nordstrom, do you have a uh, uh, do you have a, a, a microphone? I think so. Oh, I guess you do, don't you? All right. How about uh, how about you, you take us to the promised land with this one right here? A company wants to have a backup site that is a good balance between cost and recovery time objectives. Which of the following is the best solution? Uh, the choices are warm site, cold site, remote site, hot site. Um, I'm guessing that the hotter it is, the more it costs. And the colder it is and the more remote it is, the longer the recovery time. So let's go with... Well, uh, uh, let's not go with hot, and let's not go with cold. Okay, so we'll, let's not go with hot. <clears throat> let's not go with cold. Uh, so now I need to figure out whether remote is more cost effective and recovery effective than warm. And I'm going to say that war warm is uh, a good balance. Because remote's probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I kind of look at it like this right here. You know, if we say that a hot site is, you know, uh, big time money, it's fault tolerant. And if you guys don't know this, you, you may want to make, you may want to make note cards. Uh, in addition to fault tolerance here, it would also be um it's a lot of money it's fault tolerant fully redundant in that case right redundant redundant and most importantly here highly available right typically the hot site is that so a remote site is very similar to to a hot site um you know, this one could usually you uh, a company would own this one, the the actual you know facility. The remote site would be you know like AWS or Azure in this regard. Uh, 
you're still going to pay a, a pretty nice premium for it, uh, but maybe not as expensive as owning a piece of property. Uh, it definitely gives you redundancy and fault tolerance. Uh, so if something happens, you can have a, a quick failover and the remote site is going to be highly available as well. So it's very similar to the hot site and uh, you're just not going to pay as much for that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think of it like this right here. If I have a website here and I put a load balancer in between, right? So this is going to be a load balancer in between. And now I have, this is my primary right here. And then this is going to be my number two uh, of the, the, the hot site. The load balancer will always push over to this guy first until he can't push anymore to him. And then these two have a replication agreement between them that copies information. So they're carbon copies of each other. And it'll push, 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 push to this guy until it can't. And then if this guy goes down, immediately the load balancer will push it over to this, this copied website that is a carbon copy. So that's typically how a hot site works. Uh, a warm site, on the other hand, typically means that, you know, you may have servers, uh, you know, some of the, the critical systems are there. Uh, but it would take you probably, you know, around 24 hours to to recover if something happened uh, because you'd have to physically send somebody there. You'd have to, you know, send personnel physically to, to power it on, uh, you know, and then, you know, spin up the operating systems, configure everything. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things are there and available. So I usually will say, let's put two two dollar signs for that because it's not going to be as expensive as having something highly available uh this one is it's lower availability the low availability right so you're paying less for it whereas a cold site is going to be uh usually you know optical or dvds uh maybe paper copies of things uh, maybe some hard drives. Yeah, I kind of think of a cold site, kind of like a storage unit. Uh, it's going to be pretty cheap, but you compromise here. The recovery time with a very low availability, uh, you compromise. So uh, the answer for this one is warm site. Excellent job. Excellent job, man. All right, let's go back to uh, uh, about Kincaid for this next one. Kincaid, go ahead. Jane's guest, Pete, comes to her office to meet her for lunch. She uses her encoded badge to enter, and he follows in behind her. This is an example of which of the following? D, fishing. C, whaling. B, least privilege. A, tailgating. And you can get rid of D, fishing, and C, whaling at what are you uh, writing there? Oh, I'm just saying. Is are you a broadcaster? You sound you sound like you you need to be on TV there, man. That you, I mean, that was fantastic, fantastic. I mean, I did the what school news one in middle school. I mean, it's fantastic. So you you were saying? Go ahead. You get rid of uh, vishing and whaling because those are techniques to get um, information from websites and such. And then from tailgating and least privilege, you would go with tailgating because that's the one where you follow someone in. Okay, follow in behind. Tailgating follows in behind. Whaling, you're going after Barney Big Dog. Right? So, uh, like the, the CEO, CFO, um, CIO. So any C level person would be a whale right and then the principle of least privilege means that you don't give people access 
if they don't need it. All right, so you're going with tailgating and that is correct. Great job, man. Great job. All right, uh, oh, this is a good one here. Let's go with, um, how about, how about, uh, all right, no, you can't, I don't wanna go with, let me see here. Trenton, Trenton, you're my guy. Go ahead, bud. Symmetric encryption utilizes blank while asymmetric encryption utilizes blank. Uh, public keys, private keys, private keys, session keys, shared keys, private keys, Public keys one time. Uh, well, nobody wants to see, see your privates, and that's uh, that's symmetric. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of uh, A and B. Uh, and okay, you gonna get rid of A and B? Yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, D. Go with D. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. All right, so you're you're absolutely incorrect on this one. Uh, oh. Asymmetric, asymmetric. You have a private and a public key, right? It's a keyed pair. And asymmetric only works in PKI. Right, it only works on PKI. So you and I both would have to adhere to that public key infrastructure, which you know PKI. All it is is just software. That's all it is. Uh, and so you and I both would have to enroll and download the software for the PKI, uh, and then we can start doing asymmetric cryptography because I would be issued a key pair, you would be issued a key pair. And we can share our public key, but we can't, you're absolutely right. Nobody wants to see your private parts, buddy. Uh, so we don't share, <laughs> we don't share, uh, or maybe I should say, no, a Sherry, no share private. Right. What an example of, uh, Asymmetric encryption be like WebEx, possibly. How so? Or, or what's a what's a good um, example of uh, asymmetric encryption? Uh, so let's say here that you're using RSA, right? You would use RSA. That's the most common one. Uh, so RSA. Let's say that we. Um, here at Cyber Protects, why don't we we have a, a, a PKI? We install a PKI server, right? That PKI server is using RSA, which is asymmetric, right? And then for each person that we have, each person that we have. If we want to send and receive encrypted email, or digitally sign something, an email, let's say, digitally sign that email. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to, digitally sign and encrypt, you can do either or, or you can do an and, right? You don't, you can encrypt and digitally sign, or you can just digitally sign, or you can just encrypt, right? You don't need to do them both at all times. Uh, and so what would happen is each person here would get a private and a public key, private and public key for each one of them, Private, I'm not gonna write all these out, just give me a second, just do a few of them. Uh, and that would, all those private and public keys would be managed by that PKI system. So then if you wanna send, let's say this is this is Ben here, and this one down here is Trenton. You have a private and a public key down here. 
what I would do is I would go to the PKI server and I would say, yo, I want to send a uh, encrypted email to Trenton. PKI server says, here is Trenton's public key. And it gives me your public key. What I do is whatever my message is on my side that I want to encrypt, I'll use my private key and your public key because the system knows that it can deliver your the message to you because of your public key. And what it'll do is it'll encrypt it with your public key. That way, when I send it to you, then you can say, oh, yeah, that's from Ben. I'm going to use my public key to unencrypt it. And then if you need to encrypt something back to me, you can use your private key to encrypt it back. So this thing in between here, this system manages everything. It's kind of a secret sauce that is in between us here. Right? And basically, it negotiates the encryption and it negotiates the, the, the key generation. This has the certificate authority, the registration authority. You know, it has all of that in there. Uh, so asymmetric uses uh, private keys and symmetric, you actually share the keys. So another way to look at shared key is that it could use a public, one public key for that. So the answer, the best answer here would be Bravo. Bravo. All right. So are they trying to be tricky here? Because you could have uh, shared keys and public keys as well, right? And then that would be a right answer because it uses both. I mean, Which one would that be? Uh, the asymmetric, um, unless I just uh, listened to you and completely missed it, doesn't it use both public and private? Asymmetric does use both public and private. Uh, so they're just trying to throw you off here with a little trickery because uh, I got it. Yeah, so usually um, I don't use this word when I'm describing symmetric because I don't like to confuse people. So I use shared keys whenever I'm talking about symmetric because typically if, Shane, if you want to, you and I want to encrypt data back and forth, if we, if we want to encrypt data back and forth, that you will have the key over here, right? And I will have that same key over here. So we're, it's the same key. Both of us have the key. So I can encrypt it on my side. I can decrypt it on my side. You can encrypt it on your side and uh, encrypt it on your side. Uh, but at some point in the game, both of us have to have that key negotiation. And that is what one of the flaws of symmetric encryption is, is how do you get that to these people unencrypted? Like over a public internet, you know, how do I, how do, like right now, how would I get you the key? I'd have to email it to you or put it up on Dropbox or, you know, something like that. So these are the same keys between you and I, right? But if you wanted to send something to Dave, you wouldn't use that same key that you have right here. You would have another key for, for between you and Dave, right? Here, this key would be just between you and Dave. And then Dave would have one between him and you. And then if he wanted to send one to me, he would have another one for Ben. And then I would have one for Dave as well. So, this is a this is a, a, a really interesting um, way to look at it, uh, but typically it, it between two people there'll be one key, but the more people you have, the more keys that you're going to have because you're not going to use the same key for every person. Not going to do that. All right, let's do a few more here. Shane, since you wanted to get involved in the conversation, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get you going next here. Go ahead, man. 
One of the advantages of trusted platform modules, TPM is, the bottom one, it can be tied to a user's logon account for additional authentication. Um, we'll probably scratch that because it's uh, a chip and it's based in a particular asset. Um, it cannot be used as the basics for securing other encryption methods. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure um, what that's even saying, so we'll leave it for now. It's tied to the system's MAC address for secure tracking. Um, it's, I don't know if a system really has a single MAC address anymore, so we'll cross that one out. A lot of them have multiples. Um, I would go with, um, I believe it cannot be modified by a silent background process. Um, and part of that is it gets shipped with the, uh, it's a physical piece that comes from somewhere else and it's locked. You can't, uh, you can't update it later. So yeah. I would take a guess at A since I don't know what. So that's, a, that's one of the, the best ways to look at it is once this TPM is used, once the TPM is used, like let's say earlier John mentioned BitLocker, let's say you use TPM to actually encrypt a hard drive or whatever, uh, you're gonna actually lock that device. So now these two are tied to each other for life. The TPM and you know whatever your know, password you use to, to encrypt that, it, it's locked. And A is exactly the reason why you would do it. So nothing can modify it unless it knows the secret to get onto it. Uh, so C, on the other hand, if this did not say cannot here, right? If this said it can be used for the basis for securing other encryption methods, absolutely. Absolutely. If we have the TPM as a foundation, then you can use it as the basis for other security uh, encryption methods. Absolutely. But since it says it cannot, then, you know, that would be one that we would eliminate as well. A MAC address, what can we do with a MAC address? Anybody? You spoof it. Yeah, you spoof it. So we know that a MAC address is not valid. So... Uh, B, we would get rid of. So uh, I like the way you deduce that, man. Great job. All right, let's go back with, uh, uh, how about Kelsey for this one right here? Which of the following multi-factor authenticate, oh, wow, I cannot speak. I got you, authentication. <laughs> Methods uses biometrics. Uh, biometrics would be, so I'm actually going to do, um, I'm going to take off um something you know that's not going to be it um it i'm just going to say it's something you are because it's who you are it's your eyes or it's your fa fingerprint or your um things like that okay yeah absolutely so multi-factor uh so you know we think about something you know something you have or something you are Another way to think of it is something you can forget, something you can lose, or something you can get cut off, right? Any two of these, any two of these factors of authentication, any two of them, is considered what's called strong authentication. And so that's why a lot of modern day enterprises are going to two factor authentication is because it's considered strong authentication, right? Somewhere you are is actually starting to come to life more and more now, right? Because we have geolocation. Because anytime I log into my Google account, I get a notification. You've logged into a new location. Is this yeah. you? Yeah. But this one is in the tenets of authentication. The 
big three are something you know, something you have, something you are. So uh, you absolutely hit the nail on the head with this one. Great job. Um, that is fan, 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 fantastic. All right, so I see a question there. Uh, so, Josh, I, I think I, I, even before I saw your question, man, I think I, I even threw a hedge in there, right? I said, I don't like using that word, public, uh, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with symmetric key encryption. Uh, I prefer not to personally, but CompTIA absolutely does use that word they think that the public key is a shared key that's the way they look at it and as a uh, certified instructor that's the way that they want me to teach it whether or not i agree with that i totally as an expert in encryption i would totally disagree with that so i'm just letting you know for the exam public and symmetric is also synonymous with a shared key uh so keep that in mind all right uh we'll do a couple more here let me see if i can uh throw a zinger at uh at dave dave i'm coming at you here bro let me throw a zinger at you <clears throat> let's see here How about this one right here? <clears throat> Jane, administrator, is primarily concerned with blocking external attackers from gaining information from remote employees by scanning their laptops. Which of the following security applications is best suited for the task? All right, so. Well. Not going to be um, any spam or any virus software, and so um, an IDS only detects um, an attack, so it's going to be a personal firewall. You can go with personal firewall. Yes. You are correct, sir. You are correct, sir. Oh, oh, what's oh? Somebody's clapping for you. Look at that. I've been playing around with the GUI here, I guess, huh, Shane? So uh, I look at this also, and I think to myself, okay, that con context clue of blocking, I mean, that's what firewalls do is they block stuff, right? Uh, so B is the best answer here. Great job. All right, let's go back to uh, John. John, this one's for you. John, we can't hear you. Can, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Um, my mic was muted, but I was unmuted on the software. Anyway. That's okay, man. That's okay. <laughs> So, all right, Sarah, for the third time now, Sarah, an attacker, is recording a person typing in their, their ID number into a keypad to gain access to the building. Sarah then calls the help desk to inform them that their PIN no longer works and would like to change, like to change it. Which of the following attacks occurred last? Oop. Sorry. Um, you good? Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the, la the attacks that occurred last... Hmm. I was recording a person typing already. So I would say shoulders. Oh, okay. Um, tailgating. I don't think it's tailgating because they'd have to actually follow the person into a place to gain access. Um, I don't know about impersonation because I think you could technically impersonate somebody, but I don't think that's how they did it. I would say shoulder surfing. Um, phishing, I know it would be probably like would send an email and try to get it that way, but since they were recording somebody, uh, to get their 
their ID. I think that's how they would do it. Shoulder surfing? Yes. That's where you're going with? I think you, so. You got a different answer. I would think the last thing would be the impersonation. The last thing here, let's just look at it. Look at it here. Uh, a person typing in, so the recording, typing in their ID into a keypad. So that would be shoulder surfing. And then since she's an attacker, right? She calls the help desk and informs that the pen is no longer works and would like to change it. That is impersonation. Oh, okay. Impersonation. Gotcha. You know what? I tell you what, why don't you try another one, man? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, which of the following would be the best choice for attacking a complex password hash? Um, brute force intrusion, rainbow tables, dictionary files, man in the middle. Um, I don't think it would be brute force intrusion because I know that one would take forever if it would even work. Um, uh, rainbow tables, I think, is possible for a complex password hash. Okay. Um, I, I know man in the middle would be a hard one to do. I don't think it would be that one. I think rainbow tables. Rainbow tables? All right. You are correct, sir. So rainbow tables actually are, is a huge file, huge file that is, it contains a bunch of password hashes and is used for cracking passwords. So you are correct. That is right. Great job, man. So would you good sorry did i uh i was gonna ask would you even really consider man in the middle as like a way to to do something like this so the, the man in the middle attack and i i think that they uh with the with the 601 now they call it also a meet me in the middle attack and that one actually is very difficult to do um, you know, being able to, to essentially be a proxy between two uh, ends. And, you know, if you're the attacker in the middle trying to get between these guys, and then basically you're you're sending information, you're receiving it, and then you're passing it on. Uh, you, you could do that, but that wouldn't be the best choice to, to do it. I think that these two would be... Uh, the, the 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 top two choices uh but since it's a hash the rainbow table is a password set of password hashes when i was at saic we had at our cyber lab there we had an 11 terabyte rainbow table we created an 11 terabyte rainbow table for, for cracking passwords all right, I got one more here, and then we're going to take a quick break. Um, take a quick break after this. Um, uh, let's go with, uh, I, I can use the force and feel everybody saying, don't call me, Ben, don't call on me, don't call on me. Let's go with, uh, how about, how about uh, Kelsey? We'll go back with you. Kelsey, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Oh, you're waiting for me to... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a company is performing internal security audits after a recent exploitation on one of their primary uh, applications. Sarah, the security auditor, is given a workstation with limited documentation Regarding the application installed for the audit, which of the following types of testing methods is this? Oh, this is, I know this. Uh, oh, gray box, black box, white box, or sandbox. <clears throat> um, so I'm actually going to, first of all, I'm going to get rid of black box. Okay, what is that? Uh, 
I believe black box is that it would be like a malicious type of hacking, correct? No, but we'll go ahead and get rid of it. Okay. okay. Um, and then I would. Uh, I would say I would say white box. Okay. Go with white box. Mm -hmm. So let's check it out here. Oh, okay. Let's check it out here. Uh, so a sandbox, just like the name implies, right, uh, is kind of like a dev environment. So a sandbox is a, a dev environment that allows us to, to test stuff, right? So uh, usually if you have an Android, um, or you do development in Java or uh, compiled languages like C Sharp, um, it actually will use this thing that's called the Dalvik VM. And it's basically, uh, this works as a container. So it contains whatever you're doing inside of the sandbox. So if it's, if it's something nasty, it can't get out of the sandbox, right? So that's a, a dev environment where you can test stuff. A white okay. box here, a white box test, a white box test is what we refer to as an open kimono. And I hate to give you the visual here, but basically you're, you're showing your world to me, right? So if I'm going in and I'm engaging in a, a test of some sort with you, you're going to open your kimono and you're going to show your world to me. That means that you're going to give me everything you have. all right you're gonna you're gonna give me all your documentation you're gonna tell me all your ip addresses uh you're gonna give me everything you have that's gonna be a white box test uh, a black box test i always think about the black box in you know if you if you think about the news if an aircraft uh crashes and nobody knows what happens what what do they look for they look for that that testing box that's in the cockpit yeah, yeah that's the, in the cockpit right and, and then the black box is we don't know anything mm -hmm. we don't know anything and pretty much we're going into this test we're going in blind to the test. We have no idea what we're about to get into. We could open up Pandora's box and, you know, all hell breaks loose or whatever, right? We're going into a blind and that's the black box. So, the, you know, metaphorically, the aircraft is probably the best example I can give to you. I, I hate to get grim melancholy with saying that they're going to crash, but I'm sorry, opinions, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and so the gray box here then typically means that you you got you got a little but not enough and so what that means is typically you're very limited in the information you've been provided so you know if i'm paying you 10 grand to come in and do a an assessment of you know my my network um and i don't give you anything what kind of test would that be a sandbox because they have limited limited document oh i'm sorry if i don't give you anything oh if you don't give me anything black box black box right mm -hmm. i don't give you anything it's going to be a black box if i i if, you know give you everything i got white box and i'm going to do my open kimono with you here uh, yeah, it's going to be a white box. And then it's kind of the, the, the hey, you know what? I'm not going to give you everything. I want to see what you can find. Uh, it's very limited here. Limited documentation. Very limited okay. documentation. Uh, so the answer for this one gray box. would be a gray box test. That makes sense? Yes, makes a lot of sense. All right, so hopefully people are taking copious notes because we, we, when we do these test questions, we cover a whole bunch of, of goodness. 
and if you uh, are like me, I like to to make sure that I have those uh, index cards. Uh, all right, so let's take a quick commercial break here. Come on back in about seven minutes, and we'll keep the dream alive. Okay, we'll keep the dream alive.
All right, and we're back. Welcome back. Coming to you live from Studio 54 in Madison, Alabama. All right, so I'm going to put a series of unfortunate, or no, that's something else. I'm going to put a, a, a series of questions in the um, the chat window, and I want you to tell me the network command that you would use to get a desired result. Okay, what if, what, if you wanted to display network configuration for a system, what would you type? What would you type? So the wrong answer here is nothing. So if you didn't answer, I'm watching you because that means to me that you haven't played with that before because this, and I'm just gonna give you a straight dope. I'm not gonna call you out. If you, if you didn't answer that, then that means that you've not played with the, the command line. So IP config is about as simple as it possibly could get if you're looking for network configuration information for a system. Okay, that's about as simple as it possibly could get. So if you're on a Linux box, you would type if config. I'm not on a Linux box, so that's why it doesn't work, All right? All right, good. Most of you got that. If you didn't, we got some wind sprints and crab crawls out in the uh, parking lot on Tuesday that we're going to get you to do. Uh, maybe you can meet me there at 4 a.m. and I'll get my bullhorn out. Make sure that we, uh, I'll be riding in my golf cart. Oh, <laughs> that's funny because you can't get in. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, we, I think we've rectified that problem with with uh, with uh, Andrew. All right, what about this one right here? This what command does that? Trenton, yes. Dave, yes. Kincaid, yes. John, no. Kelsey, no. Lacey, no. That's right, I'm watching. So anybody who's not answering these, and I'm not gonna throw you under the bus if you're not answering, I'm just gonna tell you straight up and down. I would hate for you to get a couple of these command line questions on the exam and uh, not be able to answer them because quite frankly, these are cherry pickers right here. So go in, start playing around with stuff. Netstat shows us what is open on our system. You can see that I got Kubernetes running, which is a container machine. Um, I also have some connections out to uh, some secure websites uh, from my machine. My machine is running on the 192.168.0.47. And then the colon after that tells me what port it's connecting to on. Many of these are, are more than likely uh, websites that I'm connecting to. 
Um, but we'll just give it a second to to make that magic happen there. Okay, we'll let it kind of play itself out. Uh, I know Andrew the other night I was uh, lurking in the background and uh, I, I heard most of what was going on. Uh, so over here you have NetStat that's telling me all the open connections, right? And then um, he, he meant well the other night in his references to some of the uh the 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 things but what about this one right here it sends icmp packets to another ip to confirm network connectivity now i will tell you if you don't know this one we got big problems pookie One ping only. See Sean Connery? Yeah. Right? Give him one ping only. James Bond there in a different movie. That's right. RIP James Bond. But uh, what a great movie that... Oh. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, crazy Abby. What a great movie The Hunt for Red October is give him one ping, right? So if I want to test connectivity for my network, the simplest of troubleshooting, first things first, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna see if what my IP address is, right? And that's gonna be IP config. The second thing is, is, hey, can I ping, for me, the first, like if I'm coming in and troubleshooting network, I'm gonna say, can, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, ask can i ping google because if i can't ping google i got bigger problems right i got bigger problems if i can't ping google so and i can immediately identify what the hops are along the way um, as far as you know what i need to to take a look at so hopefully that makes sense Uh, I would encourage you, if you already have not, to also play a little bit with NMAP in ZenMap. So the network mapper tool here, if you know what your IP address is, in my case, my IP address is going to be the first entry up here, All right? So 192.168.0.47. If I know that, then what I can do here is I can scan a target network, 192. Oh, something else was already in there because I've used this plenty of times before. Uh, I'm going to scan a target network of 0 0.0 4 slash 24. Okay, because the CIDR notation there tells me it's 255, 255, 255 dot 0 for the subnet address, All right? That's the subnet, so it's forward slash 24. So nmap is behind the scenes at the command line here for zenmap. And so you can download this program, play around with it. I'm just gonna scan the heck out of it. It's an intense scan. People here at my home network probably won't be too happy with me, but whatever, I pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't get out very much, guys. Uh, so, you know, this is important because it's actually scanning the network right now. I'm going to let this kind of run in the background for a little bit, and I'll come back to it here in a few minutes. Okay, so 
there's a couple other ones that you need to know. And there's keywords that are associated with that. And I know Andrew went through a few of these the other night, but I just want to make sure that you get them because if you have five of these on your exam and you miss all five of them, uh, I think that would be a crying shame, an absolute crying shame. So what command tells us the number of hops between you and a destination? That's right. That's right. Good. Good. So you can type in trace route. I, I know there's a, a pretty popular meme out there on YouTube. Uh, some some kid was uh, created. I don't think it's a meme. I think he in real life, he really thought that it was called tracer T. Uh, but he put together a a YouTube video that where he said, so when you go in and use Tracer T, you can um, figure out how many hops it goes from one place to another. And you know what, whatever. I mean, at least the kid's playing with stuff. But if I wanted to go out and just check the number of hops between me and Dr. Google, I would just type in trace route or trace RT and uh, type in the, the place that I wanna go. And, you know, I remember when I was growing up, that uh you know especially around the halloween time uh i would love to see if i can get different candies when i when i trick or treat uh and <clears throat> here it is right here Oh, three. So apparently, you know, in our lifetime, somebody who must have a lot of free time on their hands uh, figured out that it's 367 licks to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop. Well, trace route is very similar to that, except you don't put saliva on it and it's not sweet, right? So how many hops, how many licks does it take? So how many hops does it take to get to where you need to be from the source to that destination? And it's important for you to, to recognize that uh, depends on, you know, how far you are away from, you know, the, the trunk, but trace route is a good tool. And here you are, uh, it shows you that I'm 16 hops away or 16 licks between me and the center of the Tootsie Roll pop here. So that's trace route. Uh, and I, if I was to put some money on it, I would uh, probably say that uh, <clears throat> trace route will be on your exam. All right, so in the background here, uh, this thing looks like it's still going, it's still going but it's built a topology diagram here at my house that shows you all the different uh, hosts that are on my network. And so if I click on one, I can I should be able to zoom in uh, and see each one of these. You can see I have my local host, which is this machine that I'm on. And then from that, I was able to scan. Here's my, uh, my gateway firewall here, the 1681 or 1680.1, uh, you know, there, and there's some other nodes that are on here as well. Uh, I can click on each node and then figure out some more information about it. And this particular one didn't really do me any justice here, right? Uh, you can see that, that I have a Linux box that's running 
and uh, it's it's the the gateway, the dot zero node that's out there that is working as the firewall. So uh, that is how um, InMap works. Okay, see it. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, so somebody's dropping off. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with that. What I'd like you to do here is take a look at who is. If you take a look at who is, and we, we play around a little bit with it, uh, you may end up using it in other capacities besides uh, what we currently are looking at here. So uh, who is is a, a great way for you to to learn uh, the information about um, data on websites. So not only who who is, but something like any who, that's right. Anywho, so if I go into this lab right here, I can go out to and use a tool called Anywho and find out uh, information about different addresses or different information about different people. Uh, so I can I can actually search these different things to to find out more information and do footprinting. So let's check out who is first. And then we'll go to, I think it's .net. Oh, this is not secure. Uh, so who is here? Let's say we go to cyberprotects here.com. And I'm just going to do a who is lookup here on cyberprotects. This is not secure. So I wonder if I'm blocking it. Uh, so what you may want to do is you may want to go and uh, see if you can find out. Yeah, here, here it is, whois.com. So you can go out here and do a whois lookup. Uh, you can find out cyberprotects.com. I can do a search on it. And it'll go out and tell me all the information that I ever wanted to know about this particular website if the person decided to register it and not register it private. So this particular, whoever registered this thing, uh, it shows you that the cyberprotects.com is not available. It's currently registered. Uh, it was registered on 124 2012 and whoever the person was actually paid a little bit extra money to make sure that their name was not on the internet in that capacity at least so let's just say here that i wanted to do another check on uh Let's just think here. Uh, well, I don't know. Let's see, uh, how about People Tech? I don't even know if we have any people working for People Tech. All right, so People Tech was registered in 2003, so it's been around for 17 years. And Network Solutions was the company that actually registered it. Uh, somebody's gotten smart here, right? They, they went through a perfect privacy. So you pay a little bit extra, like $15 extra to go and try to obfuscate it, make sure that nobody's name is out there. And so this is who is, this is what, what who is does. It'll tell you the domain of a, a particular person or a particular company. And, uh, it'll, it'll bring back data per that domain. So uh, that's what who is does. Uh, if you go out and 
take a look at something like Anywho, you can actually do a little bit of footprinting on someone. And this is a pretty good site here. Uh, you can find out information. It's been a while since I've been out here uh, to check this out, but I'll go in and, and do that. Uh, so I'll do a, a, a quick find here. And boom, look at that. I mean, within two seconds, you guys could be at my house and see where I live. Gosh, am I really 45 years old? I know. I mean, I look pretty good for 45 year old, but uh, whatever. Uh, so you can go out there and do a profile on yourself. Uh, this gives a, a phone number here. That phone number is whack, so I'm happy to see that. Uh, but if you want to, you can go out and, and check that out. It's publicly available, right? Uh, so if we're doing footprinting, we can also go out to another website here called Intellius. This one's kind of not fair. This one's kind of not fair. Let's say that we wanted to go and search for our friend, Kelsey Cochran, right here. And you know what? I'm not going to give a city. I'm just going to say Florida, because that's probably going to give us more robust uh, websites. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'll go ahead and agree to that. So let's just go ahead and look. Uh, it says, help narrow down the results. We're looking at all the state of Florida. Right now, it's looking at federal data sources, state data sources, county data sources, to find out, uh, has Kelsey ever lived in, you know what? Sure, yeah, why not? She probably has. I mean, I don't know that, so I'm gonna click I don't know. You know what? I think she's probably younger than that, but uh, you know, I'll say yes. You can see down here at the bottom, it's going through social media, uh, with federal data sources, state data sources, county data sources, traffic, Ooh. traffic offenses, uh, felony, uh oh, felonies. These are all public records right here. You know, I was doing this uh, about two months ago in another Security Plus class during, during the day. And I, somebody asked me to look like I usually get a guinea pig instead of just picking somebody. And uh, the person that I looked up actually did have uh, a criminal record. And they didn't think it was going to show up. And sure enough, it started to show up on here. And uh, I didn't, I pretended like it. I mean, it's hard to pretend like it, like you can't see it, but whatever. Uh, they volunteered. <clears throat> so here we are three minutes later, and we have information on Kelsey right here. Right, so uh, is any of this relevant up here, Kelsey? The top one? Nope. nope, that's not me. So usually with this website, uh, you get a little, they get a little teaser and then you got to actually pay a little bit of money for it uh, afterwards. Uh, and that's just an assumption from my perspective there, that that one was you. Oh, the, the 24 one? Yeah, that one was me. <laughs> so we'll let that one kind of uh, percolate in the background there. And uh, we'll keep, keep the dream alive by going through uh, some other stuff here. So the the different networking commands are super important i mean if you're going to be getting into the security arena i would recommend that you just go around and play with you know these these commands to make sure that you, you understand what they do i mean because a lot of them are just super simple super straightforward and uh if you don't know them then uh 
you, you definitely need to know that, okay? You definitely need to know that. Anybody, not just you know, one person or another. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about identity and access management and how important this is to everybody. Okay, uh, to me, this is perhaps one of the most important things is how we manage identities. And at the crutch or the root of everything is what's called Active Directory. Okay, so Active Directory is actually a Microsoft product and it actually will uh, allow you to create what's called a domain. And in your domain, you can add users, you can add computers, <clears throat> and you can add just objects. And it's kind of a, a neat uh, thing if you've never played with it, because Active Directory, that's the name of the software that Microsoft creates, is used in over 90% of corporations worldwide. And in my opinion, is probably the number one, the number one thing that you should know about how a domain is governed <laughs> is through Active Directory. It will add computers and network devices to the domain. Uh, it'll add users to the domain. And it is probably one of the single most pieces, single most important uh, components to understanding how all of this works. When somebody comes on board, uh, there's a, quite a bit of things that we need to do, including but not limited to with an onboarding process. There's, there's, uh, you know, we need to go ahead and create a user ID for that person. And that user ID in, in a Windows environment, user ID is called an NT login. So with Windows NT, when that came out, it's a server, they created that what NT stands for is new technology. And Microsoft created this new technology based off of the single sign-on and using a Kerberos backend. And this new technology actually creates a domain. This domain allows you to add computers, network devices, any objects, any computers, but also it allows you to push these things down to computers called security policies. And these security policies are pushed down to computers in what's called a GPO or a group policy object. So this is quite important uh, because really it is literally everything in a network. Everything that happens in a network. Okay. And so as we go through and, and talk in the remainder of the classes, you're going to be hearing me talk about this thing that is Active Directory. And primarily, it focuses on what's called IAAA, IAAA, okay? So that is the identity or identification, the authentication,
the authorization and the accountability for auditing, like holding people accountable for what they do on the network. And this is important because, you know, when we're when we go through, we create an identity, when we we update an identity, when we when we delete an identity, these are all things that happen on uh, a network. So let's do a quick exercise here and talk about the ama amazing Cyberman. Okay, this amazing Cyberman is a uh, high-paid strategic hire for you. And you want him to try to be productive on day one, day one. So what do you need to do to make this happen? What do you need to do? So, you know, when I first started getting into the business, that day one would be, if you think about a timeline. So, you know, there's, let's say, you know, 21 days out. So T minus 20, right? And then, you know, as you kind of look into the future, 21 days in the future. Mm -hmm. So here would be day zero when the person starts. What steps do we got to put in place here to make sure that they hit the ground running and be productive right here? So we're going to give you about uh, seven, eight minutes to, to put your thoughts down. Don't start putting them into the uh, chat window just yet. But think about some of the things on the jobs that you've been at and, it, and or maybe you've hired new people. What are some of those things that you're going to want to do to make sure that that person is productive on day one and feels like a productive member of the team? So we'll give you a few minutes to, to get this party going and uh, be thinking T minus 20, 21 to, hey, hitting the ground running on day one. What does that look like? All right, we're gonna give you about seven minutes. Go.
All right, so if you want to go ahead and start putting your thoughts uh, down, feel free to put your thoughts down. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you an annotation, Shane. No problem. Go ahead, man. <clears throat> you want to draw something for me, man? I don't know. I just thought that's what you meant. I, I see you wanted in the uh, chat. Yeah, go ahead, man. Oh, look at this. Yeah, things are coming back here. People are putting stuff into the chat. <clears throat> Yeah, code to get into the building. Andrew didn't get that, did he? Well, he's never going to live that down. All right, good, good. You get badge into the, okay, good. I was hoping you were typing some more stuff. <clears throat> Security clearance, good. Access to team file share, email access, computer, organized place for policies and procedures. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, and, and, and you know, in addition to that, in addition to that, We have some 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 more. Uh, oh, this just in here. It seems like it's coming in from some of these uh, some of these uh, these these states that are still outstanding. Yes, these just in. Codes and keys to rooms with computers is one thing. Here. So uh, somebody wrote that in there. So if you you need codes or something, right? So come on, watch. Boy, man, that doesn't work for me, does it? <clears throat> oh gosh, I just messed you up, buddy. Sorry. I don't mess you up. See there, look. Look at me, man. I, I just messed you up. I apologize. All right, so let me just read these off here. So uh, John Carter, he put in create user account, and get his hardware ready, the laptop, the phone, get access to the facilities, badge to scan into the, the building. Um, yeah, boilerplate software, absolutely. Uh, paperwork, security key codes, yeah, the computer, good. Probably uh, a phone, I would think, maybe a chair, right? Maybe a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse. I mean, th those are all incidentals, but shoot, you need that stuff. Uh, yeah, network documentation, machine with system admin, oh, wow. You're just going to give them system administrator access, huh? That's that's pretty nice. I love it. Can I come work for you? All right, codes and keys to the rooms with the computers. Fantastic. I love all this. All this access that um, the, the amazing Cyberman is going to get here. Uh, so a couple of a couple of other things here to to consider. Uh, maybe or maybe not, right? A couple of other things here. Let's just, let's consider this, that, uh, you know, out here, first and foremost, we're going to probably have to make this dude an offer and he's going to have to accept it, right? Out here. Uh, and then from that, uh, you know, first things first, homeboy's going to probably have to do a piss test right something like that and then uh probably after he passes that or maybe he doesn't and then it's over uh the nda the non-disclosure agreement would probably come into come to life right there 
And then, you know, the HR paperwork. So the, the, a few of you guys said that before, but, you know, like your, your bank account information, um, probably some online training that you have to do. And, you know, once you reach a, a certain point, what ends up happening with a lot of these, these larger companies out there is it will actually kick off a workflow, an electronic workflow, that will start to provision a lot of the things that Shane was, was putting into there. Uh, it'll put in maybe a badge request. Uh, it'll probably kick off some sort of background investigation if you're if you need one uh you know we probably should have a uh, after it gets to a certain point here uh you know on day one we probably should set them up with a meeting uh with the team to introduce the person maybe even take them out to lunch uh to make them feel welcome but in addition to that maybe back here uh or or even earlier than that, we probably should have them go meet the customer because if the customer doesn't get the warm and fuzzy, then uh, <laughs> we got bigger problems, right? The customer doesn't like the person. Uh, and so, you know, back in, in the olden days, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of these things used to be done by the sneaker net. Right, but now these are automated workflows, and this is a huge, huge part of cybersecurity. So those jobs that we were showing the first day, or you know, we showed there, uh, this is a huge part of cybersecurity. Is is handling the the automation of new hires, handling the the provisioning of new accounts and or new access, and then you know if if homeboy is overconfident here, you know after thirty days or whatever, you know that he pisses off the wrong person. Well, what if we need to terminate him, right? How do we do that? And so all these things to consider whether it's the, the create the identity, the update the identity, or the, the terminate. And I think we talked about this before, the CRUD operand is create, update, and delete. And so we need to be able to do that with any, any identity that is provisioned. We can provision it in a way to create it. We can provision it in a way to update it. And we can provision it in a way to delete it. And so from that, this automation is done through workflows. Typically, there's two things that end up happening. These systems communicate over a text-based language called XML. And there's two different types of XML that's used to provision accounts, okay? And I want you to, to look these up and shoot me an email what these mean. SAML and SPML. These are two things that are important uh, out there. And one is the service assertion markup language. The other one's the service uh, provisioning markup language. Uh, but the amazing Cyberman, is uh, you know a strategic hire he's going to hit the ground running on day one and be productive because we provisioned his accounts through automation using the xml based saml language and the spimmel language okay all right so we do have a little bit of homework for you over the weekend i'll be shooting that out a little bit later uh the videos should, they should already be up there. Um, I'm not 100% sure I haven't checked yet, but one of the interns was supposed to do that. Uh, and if they're not, then I'll make sure that I pop those videos up there so you guys can watch some of them over the weekend. Uh, any questions for me before I, I let you go? Can you believe that it's already 8.30? I mean, gosh, time flies when you're having fun. 
So from this uh, this last slide here is what's going to be on the test? It's a great question. Great question. So in this provisioning will absolutely be on your test, and these two ways that things are provisioned will also be on your test. So the SAML and the SPIML will be on the test. So I kind of understand CRUD will give us the provisioning? The CRUD, but uh, more importantly, down here, these two. Okay. SAML and SPIML. So SAML is basically you, you, you're able to automatically log on to a system, and then SPIML is you're actually telling the system that you want to create update or delete something good question do you mind going back to that last slide for a sec with all your yeah. not this one the other one yeah just the previous yeah this one right here yes sir i'll just i'll just get a screenshot real quick yeah i don't know if this slide you send out we won't have your uh, your uh, markups yeah Okay, I'm done. And we'll we'll have these uh we'll have these printed out for Tuesday along with the the next domain. I think that, that uh, we have either three or four classes left. Is that is that right? Anybody? Know? Yeah, I think it's three. Three of them. Okay. Yeah, and my goal is to to work with you guys. So I don't want you to think that uh, you know just because the end of the class is the end of the class that I'm just going to leave you high and dry. We're going to, we're going to work with you to get you certified. So anybody who's struggling, um, you know, shoot me an email. If you're, if you're interested in learning this stuff a little bit more, um, you, you can come on in. I mean, especially next week, we were freed up a little bit. You can come on in. I can sit down with you. We can, we can play with some, some virtual machines and I can kind of show you a few things. Uh, feel free to, to hit me up. Let me know that you're interested in that. Uh, if you are, I'm more than happy to meet with you and, and kind of walk you through some things that you may be struggling with, okay? Uh, I'm not, I won't charge you for it. I mean, just just come on in and, and uh, make sure you coordinate with me uh, beforehand. Okay, any questions? Uh, I had a question. I think it's more like a technical. I don't, it doesn't really have to do with anything that we've done tonight anyway. Um, network address translation, you, uh, you had mentioned that that came around like for IPv4 because it was starting to end. I guess it was, it was created because people were worried about that, uh, or about losing all the IP. But anyway, before that came around, was everything just a public facing IP before like network trans, uh, address translation? That's a great question, man. So, uh, great question. Great question. Uh, so Really, when Active Directory was created, so the Microsoft Active Directory, when people started having domains, there was a need to have a different IP address schema internally for corporations. And what was starting to happen, like in the mid-90s, is a lot of these big companies that were out there uh, they started buying up I, all the IP version four IP addresses, and uh, you know that there needed to be a way that you weren't on the internet all the time. So uh, from that, you put a firewall out there with the border public facing IP address, and then internally you can use whatever scheme that you want to use as far as IP addresses are concerned. So. Uh, that is one of the main reasons why NAT exists is because you can use whatever schema you want internally. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So I, I mean that anybody that's struggling with any of this stuff, if you if you coordinate with me, I'm more than happy to to start meeting with you. My goal is that you know everyone is certified by the end of the year if not by the end of november hopefully before thanksgiving and if you're struggling with some things then come on and meet with me don't feel like you're 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 bothering me i'm more than happy to sit down with you and show you uh some of the the, the cool things that, that we do but more importantly what's going to be on the exam and you know teach you how to use some of these tools 
Uh, so hopefully you'll take me up on that offer. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you next Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, we're going to go through the, the remainder of the curriculum, probably play around with some more practical exercises, and we'll go from there. Okay, have a great weekend. Thank you, sir.